But uh, the title of my message today is One Race, the Human Race. One Race, the? Human race. One Race, the? Human race. Right. I want to tell you that here in South Africa, people have been brainwashed. People have been what? They've been brainwashed. Because we've been told that there are many different races. And I want to challenge that biblically. There's only one race, and that's the human race. And you see, if we want to transform society, we cannot use the same language that has been given to us by a de demonically inspired ideology. Are you hearing me this morning? And what has happened is a lot of us have been defined by a racist system that is demonically inspired, but we've internalized the, that definition. We've embraced it, and we've socialized along those categories that were given to us by other people. Now, when you study worldviews, it's important that we start at the place of definition. How do we define things? When we're talking about marriages today, we have to start off and say, how does God define marriage? When we talk about people, we have to say, how does God categorize people? Not how is men socially constructed how we should be categorized. Amen. And so we need to challenge this from the get-go. And I'm going to unpack it this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 to 21. We're called to love our neighbor. The Bible says we love because he first loved us. If someone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a, he's a liar. You know what saddens me? What saddens me is that many so-called religious people who say over and over again, we love God, we love God, have used religion to hate their brother. And yet the Bible here says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Because the two go together, loving God and loving people who were created in his image. Amen. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now we covered it last week where I said to you, well, who is your brother? Who is your neighbor? And what did Jesus say? And we spoke about the Samaritans. He gives us the parable of the good Samaritan. And I spoke to you about the racism that was there between the Jews and the Samaritans and the history. And you know that in actual fact, the Samaritans, in terms of Samaria and their land, that was where the outcasts of the Jews were sent to back in the day, from the Old Testament times. So you know when they would say, you're unclean. You know when they would say, we're casting you out of the temple. You would literally then go and be embraced by the Samaritans. Oh, you've been kicked out and you would go there. All right? They were known as half-breeds because when the Jewish people were in exile, right, the Assyrian Empire took over and so on, and they went into exile, these guys stayed, and then they mixed with people who were worshipping foreign gods. So there's a history of strong racism between them, and yet Jesus said, love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? That Samaritan over there. Are you hearing me? Many people think they're very loving, because they love their family members. But that's expected. Jesus says, how can you think you're my disciple just because you love your kids or you love your brothers and you love your sisters? The pagans do that. They're nice to their friends. The heathen people do that. They're nice to their friends. But the measure of the love of God in you will be seen when you show love to people who are not like you, to people who are not related to you. But I'm going to show you just now that we're all related. Amen. It doesn't matter what you look like. I believe that the church needs to be a voice to address this, this issue of racism. Because some of the people out there who are the most outspoken when it comes to racism, they themselves are very racist. Have you noticed that? All right? And so we're going to go into that. In the book, Overcoming Our Racism, by a guy called uh, Dr. Darrell Wing Su, okay, uh, he defines racism as any attitude, action, or institutional structure or social policy that subordinates a person or group because of their color. It's a powerful definition, isn't it? Any attitude, action, or institutional structure 
or social policy that subordinates a person or group because of their color. And you know what's sad for me? Is there a lot of black people out there who think that if you're a black person, you can't be racist? You've heard that before, haven't you? No, 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 black people, and their argument is that racism is to do with power. You see, and so their mindset is, no, white people still have economic power. Therefore, if you are black, because white people have economic power, then if you're black, you can't be racist because you don't have power over white people. All right? Let me tell you something. The heart is wicked and it's deceitful above all else. Scripture shows us. And it doesn't matter who you are, you can be racist because there are different types of racism. Amen. And I'll explain this maybe uh, next week. But you have institutional racism, you have structural racism, and you have individual racism. How many of you know that I was, for example, um, a couple of days ago, I was at Home Affairs. I mean, if, you, if you go to Home Affairs, it's, it's no respect of person. It's no respect of money. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. If you're parked off there and you have to get a document, you're there. It doesn't matter how many kids you've got, you've got your kids, right? I remember being in a queue and some people thought I was pushing in, but I'd been sent to get a form because I'd completed the wrong form. And then I went back in and the people in my queue were saying, cool, it's fine, you can go back in. Then other people were complaining. And they were like saying, I don't care, suit or no suit. I wasn't even wearing a suit, but anyway, <laughs> suit or no suit, they must just go. And I, was, I thought, okay, but these are women I'm dealing with. Women are always nice, aren't they? Okay. And I, and I was like, are you, are you sure? Do, and me? Do I have to leave the queue? Yes, yes, all right. And then the guy who was serving us, he said, listen, I have to listen to their appeal. You know, he didn't take responsibility. Anyway, but the point I'm making is there were people of different shades of color, different backgrounds. They were all there. Some were complaining, some were not. It didn't matter. But if someone is giving you a service and they themselves are racist and they don't like this person over this person, they've got power over you in that situation. And I thought to myself, I think I'm going to end up being here all day. Let me go to Mabopane. And so I drove to Mabopane, where the service is a lot better than here, to be honest with you. Amen? So I drove out there, and the people like me there, we do stuff, I've prayed for them there, and so on. The point I'm making is... <laughs> No, seriously, I got there and there was a lady, she was registering her baby. I said, oh, you've got a baby. You know what? I'm a pastor. Let me pray for you. Prayed for her. Someone then sees me praying. They come up to me. Oh, I've got a sore back and my, my head prayed. How are you feeling now? I'm fine now. Just go and so on. Simple faith. I'd rather be with those people than other people. <laughs> All right. But the point I'm making is anyone can be racist. Because power dynamics are not just structural, power dynamics are not just institutional, power dynamics also happen at an individual level. Amen. All right? And we'll go deeper into that at some stage. You know, um, people don't have to become like you in order for you to relate to them. People don't have to become like you in order for you to relate to them. When we're talking about diversity, God is calling us to love people who don't look like us. God is calling us to love people who speak a different language. We don't have to make them become like us in order for us to like them. You know, if you, if you study colonialism and you look at the different things that happened on the African continent, remember with the French, the French had different approaches. But one of the approaches in terms of uh, colonialism, uh, one of the approaches was basically assimilation where the idea was to take over, but to assimilate people into your culture, make them dress like you and be like you. Then it's like, oh, okay, he's a nice French gentleman. You know, now we can connect. But then they also had different approaches in different places. That's why you'll find certain French colonies are very French in culture, in dress, in language. And then other French colonies weren't as such. Does that make sense? All right. I remember being in a situation where a white Afrikaans friend of mine, really great guy, he once said to me, and I think it was maybe a slip of the tongue on his part or he wasn't fully aware of what he was saying, but he once said to me, Paul, you know what? My friendship with you has been very healing. The fact that I'm a friend of yours, it's actually helped me to see black people differently. And then he said something interesting. He then said, you know, it's like you're becoming whiter to me every day. <laughs> And then I said to him, so is white the standard? 
And then he was very quick to say, no, 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 and I should be coming blacker to you, you know, every day. But here's the point. People don't have to become like you in order for you to connect with them. Amen. All right. We're talking about celebrating diversity. We're talking about loving people even if they speak broken English and you don't like how they speak. Even if they speak broken Afrikaans or broken Zulu, you still celebrate them. Amen. Because they were created in God's image. Now, I still remember also some people who think they're not racist, but they are. I remember one guy at school, and I don't know why at school would always talk about racial dynamics and so on. Growing up in Zim and so on, we, we spoke freely about these things. But um, I remember one friend of mine at school, a white guy, and he said to me, you know what, Paul, with guys like you, it's fine, I'm cool with you. But it's the guys like, you know, the farm laborers out there on our farms and so on. Yeah, with them, I, it's a different story by prejudice. But with guys like you, I know it's fine. Can you see what the problem is? But, and he thought he was cool. He thought, cool, it's fine and so on. And he thought I would be happy with that statement. Are you hearing me? We're not called to love people because they're in the same social class as us. We're not called to love people because they're just as clever as us or cleverer. We're called to love all people. Amen. Amen. The way you deal with cycles of racism is through forgiveness and what I call voluntary identificational repentance. You can't force it. You can't legalize it. We can come up with all sorts of laws. We can do the BEEs and all these things that we impose on people. But only God can change the human heart. And the human heart changes when there's forgiveness, if you feel you were wronged, and when you feel that you did wrong, there's identificational repentance. What do I mean by identificational repentance? When you repent, you repent like Nehemiah did. Remember how Nehemiah was a righteous man, but he went before God and he cried out and says, Father, we have sinned against you. Do you remember Daniel? Daniel was a righteous man, but he says, we have sinned against you. He took on the identity of everyone else and on behalf of everyone else who had done wrong, his people, he says, we've done wrong. It's me as a man being able to go up to a woman. Who can I go up to? Debbie. And say, Debbie, as men, we have wronged you. We've abused you. We've, um, we've led you along. We've flirted with you. Right? We've uh, beaten you up. I'm sorry on behalf of all men and I'm representing men. Does that make sense? Okay. So we do that. We say on behalf of our people group, this is what we've done. And remember, a true apology involves restitution. It's where you say, God, you know what? We've done this particular thing. And from the bottom of my heart, this is how I want to make right because of what my group of people have done. But it's a voluntary thing. It can't be legalized. It can't be imposed on people. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, <clears throat> if we don't do it this way, I'm telling you right now, our kids are going to be confused. South Africa, almost to the day, it's almost 24 years, isn't it? You know that today you've got people, think about it, a 24-year-old person, they've just finished university. In fact, 24-year-old, that's enough to have your master's, right? Honors, master's or so. And they're now looking for a job. This person has never known segregation. They've never known it. And now they're looking for a job and they're told, because of the color of your skin, you can't have a job, even though the person is brilliant. Or maybe they're growing up in this environment and they're saying, you know what, I want to go and study further. But they're told there are not enough universities for you and universities here aren't for people like you. You now need to study overseas. Do you know what it's doing to young people today? People who didn't grow up with racism, but in their minds they're now thinking, because of the color of my skin, eh, okay, but what did I do wrong? Oh, I'm so, so good at rugby. Oh, but there's a quota system. And now I can't play. So we, we're perpetuating a lot of bitterness and a lot of resentment. I'm going to show you in the word just now. Are you hearing me this morning? Right? The only way for us to uproot this cycle of discrimination is for forgiveness, for identificational repentance, for restitution. Right? And we're going to go a bit deeper into it. One of the major causes of racism is what I call the biological myth. The biological myth. And it was popularized because of evolution. 
The biological arguments for racism actually increased after 1859, when Charles Darwin, who we all know of, right, um, in, the eight, in the 1800s, before 1859, in the 1800s, what would happen is they would talk about people groups, just like in the Bible. So they would say the Scottish race, the Irish race, if they used the term race, okay? They would talk about ethnic groups. They wouldn't define and categorize people based on the color of their skin, right? Now, what ended up taking place is when Charles Darwin came on the scene, and um, he wrote that famous um, book, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection, we actually saw that there was an increase of this biological argument. And this is a racist teaching that emphasized that different races or groups evolved at different rates. Are you seeing where I'm going now? It was the mindset of the day now, people who were influenced by Charles Darwin, to say, oh, okay, dogs evolved like this, Cats evolved like this. They were once this, now they're this. People also evolved. Can you, see, can you see the danger of that? Your philosophy will affect your ideology and your morality. Because if you believe that people evolved and they were once apes and then they became human beings, now you're going to categorize those human beings and say these ones are more evolved than those ones. And we know for a fact that Adolf Hitler, when he was talking about the Aryan, Aryan race, his mindset was, these are the most evolved people. And then black people over there, they're closer to the apes. That was the mindset. And the moment people end up defining a group of people in a certain way, it then justifies all sorts of behavior. Oh, let's go to the guys in the Aborigines in Australia, who they saw as almost uh, the, what they would call the missing link between apes and modern man. So, oh, okay, so it's okay to exterminate these people. And that's what was happening. Do you remember there was a time when um, the, there was a, the, what, what was called the African pygmy, right? The African pygmy was literally pictured in a zoo next to an orangutan. That was the mindset of the day. Congo pygmies were once thought to be small, ape-like, elfish creatures. There's a guy called, called Ernest Haeckel, and he's famous for popularizing the now discredited idea. And uh, this particular idea, he would say things like, at the lowest stage of human mental development are the Australians, and he was talking about the Aborigines, right? Some tribes of Polynesians and the Bushmen, Hottentots, Okay, these have become derogatory, obviously. And some of the Negro tribes. Nothing, however, is perhaps more remarkable in this respect than, this, that, than that some of the wildest tribes in Southern Asia and Eastern Africa have no trace whatever of the first foundations of all human civilization, of family life and marriage. They live together in herds like apes. That was the mindset this person had. A scientist at the Advancement of Science Convention in Atlanta stated, race is a social construct derived mainly from perceptions conditioned by events of recorded history, and it has no basic biological reality. Is everyone following this morning? Okay. There are some people who then came up with a theory that, oh, um, certain people's brains are smaller than other people. But how I many of you know that it's been found that you, the size of your brain, the physical size of your brain, doesn't predetermine your IQ? Men have bigger brain size, they, the physical size of their brains, bigger than women. But there's no evidence that men are cleverer than women. In fact, if you actually look at the stats in terms of college results, women are actually performing better than men. Amen. 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 Come on, ladies. Amen. All right. So if you see any data out there, there's some data out there, for example, that says that in America, the, the, because there's an IQ gap between black people in America and white people, but that's not to do with biology. It's to do with other factors. Amen. Okay. It's actually been found that the brain size of the average child in America, whether white or black, is actually the same 
and then things change a bit later on. You know, there's the elasticity of your brain. Your brain doesn't stay the same. There are things that develop your brain, grow your brain, feed your brain, and there are things that also affect it negatively. Okay? And I think we need to nail this as Christians because there's some people where this biological myth and this biological argument is what has fueled a lot of racism, hasn't it? Okay. Megan Gannon, she quotes that four scientists concluded that racial categories are weak proxies for genetic diversity and they need to be phased out. There's another guy called Svante um, Pabo. He says this, what the study of complete uh, genomes from different parts of the world has shown is that even between Africa and Europe, for example, there is not a single absolute genetic difference meaning no single variant where all Africans have one variant and all Europeans have another, another one, even when recent migration is disregarded. So he ended up uh, telling life science that it is all a question of differences in how frequent different variants are on different continents and in different regions. There's an interesting example and I'll share this with you and I wanna go into the detail of it. In one example that demonstrated genetic differences, um, were not fixed along racial lines, the full genomes of James Watson and Craig Venter, two famous American scientists of European ancestry, were compared to that of a Korean scientist, okay, uh, whose surname was Kim, obviously, I guess, Korean, okay, seeing Jin Kim. It turned out that Watson, who ironically became ostracized in the scientific community after making racist remarks, and Venter shared fewer variations in their genetic sequences than they each shared with Kim. I don't know if you got that. In other words, they had more similarities, each of these guys of European descent with the Korean guy than they had with each other. Do you know that it's been found that if a white person needs an organ transplant, right, and wants to find tissue match with someone else, Many times that match, the best match, can be found in a black person than in a white person. Are you hearing me? All right? So just because we look different on the outside, it doesn't mean that there's actually a whole lot of difference. In fact, what has been found in studies is that our differences are cultural. They're more cultural and linguistic than they are to do with so-called race. And also works the other way around. If you need some kind of organ transplant and so on, don't assume that it will come from someone who looks like you on the outside. It might come from a Chinese person. It might come from an Indian person uh, uh, in Northern India. It might come from someone from Mongolia. <coughs> Amen? Amen? And yet we've believed this lie that, oh, okay, we are now called this. And we will now be categorized the same way that you are calling us. And we will now relate and marry and produce children along these lines that you've told us. One of the interesting examples is so-called colored people. And whenever I talk about colored people, I like to use the term so-called because I don't want to embrace a term that was imposed. If you look at so-called colored people, in southern Africa, and that's the only part of the world where we use that term, by the way. The rest of the world doesn't use it, right? You will notice that certain people who became so-called mixed race, some of them, it was because they were Dutch settlers, right, who had kids with Khoisan women, and it was kind of like that combo quite a bit. Okay, and that's where you have the guys, the Greek guys, and so on, Greek land, etc. You know, Northern Cape, and so on, right? You've got that group of people, right? And it was interesting because the Greek people originally they had been categorized as native African, but then they said no, we would rather be called colored. This was quite a bit later on, so that they didn't, ha so that uh, they didn't have to go around with that identity card, that pass, that was limiting the movement of black people, right? So you've got that crowd. Then you've got the people who are from Malaysia coming and having relationship with your Zulu, your Tosa, and so on. And so you have a group of people there. 
But what happened was, then you've got people from uh, the Western European countries coming and then mixing with various people. But all these people, it was like, you know what, instead of acknowledging that, hey, you know what, you've got ancestry from the Zulu side. Hey, connect with your grandparents there and so on. Hey, you've got ancestry from Malaysia. Hey, that's part of your heritage. Instead of speaking about ethnicity, someone came along and said, we're going to group all of you guys who are a mixture together. And if you look at similarities across there, there were more similarities in many cases with certain other people from out of the group than from within that particular group because it was a socially constructed group. And once you're put in a group like that, the mindset is then, okay, so I will just marry someone else who's also been categorized in this particular group. Is everyone following me? All right? Be very careful of that. So this is the biological myth. Now, if you think of my situation, if you think of my kids, let's just, let's just go there. Let's personalize it a bit. Technically speaking, in this country, my kids would be categorized as colored, right? But what does that actually mean? Because in their mindset, they know, okay, we're, we're Zimbabwean. We're Zimbabwean. My parents are Zimbabwean. My mother is a Zimbabwean of, she, they, they would say, my mother is a Zimbabwean of Irish and English descent. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's go deeper into the biology of this. Because a lot of times people don't understand that if Adam and Eve were mid-brown, Okay, and that's just your skin color and your eye color is, and your hair color is just determined by melanin content. That's the thing that determines your pigmentation. If Adam and Eve were mid-brown, do you know that it means that when they had kids, and they had many kids, not just Cain and Abel, right? That's how people then ended up, you know? So they would have mar married siblings and that kind of thing. That's just how it would have happened, right? Um, but they would have had lots of kids because these guys lived for years and years and years, all right? But the point is that just from those two people, the variety in their children would be massive. How many of you have studied genetics? It's quite complicated, but the variety, they could have had very pale colored kids and then very dark colored kids. And if any of you, if the people who are so-called colored in this room, you, you know what I'm talking about. Because you can have mom and dad, and then you can have a very pale skinned brother and then a, a brother who's darker than most black people. But you're all, you look very different, but you're categorized that way. If you look at my family setup, Samuel came out with blonde hair and an olive colored skin and green eyes. Jaden comes out with blonde hair, but the texture of his hair is more hard Mashona type, right? <laughs> Which he, you know, he has to process that. But anyway, it's more hard Mashona type, right? And then, uh, but he came out with blue eyes. Which means there must have been a recessive, because blue is a recessive gene. So there must have been some mixture in my background. For those of you who don't understand that, in terms of blue eyes, brown eyes are stronger in terms of genes than blue, right? And then Daniel looks Samoan. He's, everything is brown. Brown hair, brown skin, brown eyes. From the same parents. Many black South Africans don't like to admit that they've got mixture. I just need to look at your nose and I can see that this is not a Bantu nose. <laughs> I can see some Portuguese there. It's, it's, we can see that. Right? You can see the angular features and you're like, okay, what's, what's there? And then you speak to the person and say, yeah, no, my grandmother was colored. So-called colored. And you also see it with a lot of, even, even your, with your white Afrikaans people, some which are very staunch and proud of the fact that I'm white and I'm really white. And then you see them when they have a tan and you can see that, okay, there was a bit of a, there was another influence here. <laughs> okay. Dr. Douglas C. Wallace, professor of molecular genetics at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, he stated that the criteria that people use for race are based entirely on external features that we are programmed to recognize. We've been programmed to recognize those, those things. And the result of this, I'll speak next week about the consequences of racial prejudice. 
when, you, when you're programmed to think, I'm seeing a black person doing this, it means this. You come to certain conclusions that are what we call perceptual distortions. I remember one time I was doing some work, I was coaching a leader in one of the banks and I pitch up at the bank and one of the ladies, she was, uh, I'm saying this so that we don't, we're not biased, okay? She was a so-called colored woman, middle-aged, right? And she was at reception and I said, I've got a meeting with this per person, this leader, who was a white female. And she said to me, I was wearing a smart suit, she said, have you come for an interview? But I had a coaching session with this person. So I think I told her, no, I've got a coaching session with her. So she was coming from a background where she's not used to seeing a black person, so-called black person, my age, looks like me, having a meeting with someone else, but a meeting where, in a sense, I've got the power. I'm the one imparting the knowledge. Wasn't used to that. So the assumption was, it must be for an interview. So her power dynamic was fixed. If a black person is interacting with a white person, it must be. There have been times when I take my wife out on a date and so on, and you can see that the waiter might be thinking, it doesn't happen as much nowadays, but you can see the waiter might be thinking, I'm this guy who's going for it, well, maybe I'm being interviewed by her. She's recruiting <laughs> me or something. Seriously, to a point where my wife has sometimes actually insisted that, you know what, I must pay for all the, the bills and so on, so that they, they, it changes their mindset. Well, sometimes the waiter wants to give her the bill. <laughs> and I think sometimes it's from the mindset that, okay, I think white people tip better than black people. <laughs> sometimes that's the mindset, right? That very same day in that workplace, I then go up and I'm, I'm by the elevator. And then there's a young black woman who reports to that particular individual who I was about to coach. And she said exactly the same thing. Oh, have you got a meeting with our boss? Yes, I do. Oh, okay, have you come for an interview? No, I've come to coach your boss. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. And these are mindsets people have. I remember one time I was about to do a workshop for um, a, a particular insurance company, I won't mention its name, and the CEOs, you know, the top level, the exco, they were all going to be there. And this was a few years ago, and I arrive in my vehicle, and I remember the security guard there. He says to me, okay, so do you work for Jaguar? Uh, so his mindset is that if you drive a particular type of vehicle, and you look like how I look, and you're my skin color, you must be a driver for that organization. You can't actually have your own one. Are you hearing me? Amen. Then I re-educated him, because one of the ways to deal with discrimination, and it comes from all quarters, eh? It's not like people who are not like you, or not your skin color, are the ones who discriminate against you. And everyone does it. And I see it as this, there's empathy. And I see it as, you know what, this guy's world is limited. So let me educate him, and then he won't make that mistake again. I got one of the best pieces of customer service excellence I've ever received from a security guard afterwards. Because I told him, and I tried to expand his world. Amen? Scientists admit today that biologically there's only one race of humans, homo sapiens sapiens. The difference between us are more cultural than racial. And so it's better that we start speaking about ethnicity, that we start speaking about language group and people group. Jesus never categorized people racially. He spoke of nations, he spoke of ethnic groups, he spoke of cultural groups. The Bible doesn't use the term race. Race is something that we've been socially constructed into and programmed into. And as a result, it's caused unnecessary division. When it comes to ethnos or people groups, depending on how you count the different groups, they're between 12,000 and 24,000 people groups, okay? Depending on how you categorize them. So a people group, for example, if you think of Native American Indians, you will say the Cherokee Indians. That's the Cherokee Nation. If you're thinking of this country, you could categorize them into about 11 or 12, but they could also be subcategories. Amen? Why don't we primarily talk about ourselves as, I'm South African, I'm Mozambican.
than how we've been categorized. I also want to say to you that we all have one blood. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, this is so powerful. There are people out there who actually think when you open up someone who's of a different skin color, that their blood is a different color or their organs look different. There are people who've got that mindset. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, it says, from one man, he made all the nations. Isn't that powerful? This is so fundamental. From one man, he made all the nations. Why did we end up with such racism when we've got the same father, as it were? The same ancestor, as it were? The next time someone comes to you and says, you black people or you Indian people, you can actually show them scientifically that we all come from the same person. There's actually a, a, a book out, and I obviously don't agree with all the evolutionary stuff that's in it and so on, but it's called The Seven Daughters of Eve. I was told about it by Johnny Clegg. Did I tell you guys, I, I, he came and sat next to me, him and his wife. I think I showed you and I showed you the picture. And you know, he's an anthropologist, right? He's into anthropology and so on, study of man and beginnings of man and all of that. That's part of his background, not just the music side. We know him for his music. I saluted him. I said, you know, thank you for your contribution, how you've used your gift and so on. He told me about his illness. I had a chance to pray for him also. Um, prayed for him and that kind of thing. But he shared with me about this book. And he says this book actually then points to the evidence of Adam and Eve. Because it's called The Seven Daughters of Eve. And they've actually done studies where they actually saw that if you look at the maternal line, you'll notice, and they did a study on uh, a number of European countries. They saw that they were what were called clan mothers. And everyone could be traced back to these seven women. And then if you go further than that, you then also then trace them back to Adam and Eve. Okay? And you can also do the same for men, in for, um, for clan fathers, as it were. But the point I'm just making is this is proven scientifically. And it says, from one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So even though these people were living in many different places, they were scattered throughout the earth, that was God's plan, that they have dominion, right, over all the earth and they subdue the earth. But they came from one man. Other point I want to emphasize is we were all created in God's image. There, there are no classes of human beings. You can't be more human than someone else. Amen? Amen. There are no groups of people that are more evolved than other people. And you might laugh and you might think, Paul, this is crazy. There's a famous pop star, and I'm not going to mention her name because I don't want you to, to not like her. A white, famous pop star. And she was at some stage in a relationship with a black guy who was mistreating her. And afterwards she said, no, it's fine. It's okay. You know, they're just, uh, some people are more evolved than others. Okay? That's the mindset. So I'm not just thumb-sucking things here, right? We were all created in God's image. Genesis 1, verse 26 to 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So if all men come from Adam and are created in God's image, how dare we create classes of human beings? All men and women were created for dominion. No one was created to be oppressed by another human being. Amen? No one was created for slavery. No one was created for oppression. If you feel oppressed in your own home, that's not of God. If you feel oppressed at work, that's not of God. God created each one of us for dominion. Take dominion in your industry. Take dominion in the marketplace. Take dominion in all that you do at school. No one was created to be subjugated to another human being. Amen. If you're a leader in business, if you're a leader in your school, 
Make sure that you empower people and help them to lead and take dominion. Amen. When you're raising your kids, make sure that they rise up with such strong self-respect that they're able to say, "Mm -mm, my father would never have spoken to me like that. I remember someone who was being abused by their husband the one time, and one of the things they said to me was, Paul, the way he speaks to me, the way he treated me, my father would never have done that. I didn't grow up like that. As we raise our children, as we raise the next generation, we must raise them in a manner that would make them not accept any kind of oppression. Amen. Yeah, you can clap. So we see that the Bible speaks of ethnicity, not race. In Revelation 7 verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From where? From every nation, tribe, people, and language. That is the language of the Bible. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne of the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. So newsflash, heaven is going to be very mixed. So start getting used to it. We can't be segregated in the church and then we slip into glory and now we're in heaven and then it's like going to be a cultural shock for some people. (gasps) I'm banking with this person in heaven. I'm sharing a mansion with this person in heaven but they don't look like, like me. We must get used to it. So my question to you is, why do people look different? Why do people look different? So-called racial differences. I'm talking eye color. I'm talking skin color. I'm talking uh, eye shape. They're actually not major differences. They're not that material. That's why you can have in the same family someone with blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes. Amen? Amen? That's why you can have in the same family someone with blonde hair, brown hair, and red hair. Now, those are striking differences when you look at someone. But genetically, they've got the same parents. So let me explain to you. Let me explain it to you. They account, all these differences I'm talking about, these so-called racial differences, they account for 0.012% of human biological variation. And that's why I said to you, if a white person is looking for a tissue match in an organ transplant, they might find it from someone who looks very different on the outside to them. Okay? Think about it this way. Do you remember the time in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel? What happened then? God scattered people, right? And gave them their own language. He says, go, you guys do this, you guys do this. Do you know what it tells me? It tells us that in the beginning... There were a whole lot of people living in the same environment, but they actually looked quite different to each other. But then they were mixing and mixing and mixing and mixing and mixing, right? God then sends them out, and because now their languages are confused, people are more likely to associate with people where there are no language barriers. They associate with people where it's like, oh, we're speaking the same language and so on. Then you ended up having more and more people looking the same who went to different regions of the world. But in the beginning, they were looking quite different, but in the same region. Have you ever wondered why it is that your Arab people look how they look? Just think about it. What, who do they look like? If you're a mixed person here and you go to the Arab world, from, in terms of skin tone, eye color, hair texture and so on, There'll be a lot of similarity, right? So how did those people become what we call here colored? There was a lot of mixture happening there and then. People would have cousins who had uh, blue eyes and fair hair, but also on the other extreme, black hair and dark brown skin. And those people were mixing and mixing and mixing. That's why in that part of the world, there are a lot of people who look so-called colored, but they're there. That's my theory on that. And uh, you can see it proven scientifically. All right? Let's go a little bit, um, a little bit deeper. Okay? Blue eyes are because of the thin layer of brown melanin, and it's due to the way the light scatters off it. Okay? So blue eyes aren't really blue. 
So another thing I just want to say. It's actually because the melanin that gives you pigment is actually very thin. And when the light scatters on it, right, it then looks blue. That's why people with blue eyes, sometimes their eyes look a bit grayish, don't they? Okay, and they also change color. So it's also to do with the light. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to share with you, South Africa, all of you listening by way of internet, by way of YouTube, I want to announce to you that we're actually all the same color. We're just different shades of the same color. That's, that's, that's what it is. We're actually all the same color. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so so let, let's go a little bit uh, deeper. There are two main forms of melanin. There's eumelin, eumelin that's brown to black, and then um, a, a different one that's red to yellow, okay, femelanin. And these combine to give us the particular shade of skin that we have. That's why, in a sense, we are all different shades of the same color. Um, I'll go deeper into the biology quickly. Melanin is produced by melanocytes, which are cells in the bottom layer of the epidermis. That's basically your skin. No matter what our shade of skin, we all have approximately the same concentration of melanocytes in our bodies. Melanocytes insert melanin into melanosomes, which transfer the melanin into other skin cells, which are capable of dividing stem cells, primarily in the lowest layer of the epidermis, According to one expert, melanosomes, these are tiny melanin packaging units, are slightly larger and more numerous per cell in dark-skinned people than light-skinned people. They also do not degrade as easily and disperse into adjacent skin cells to a higher degree. Geneticists have found that four to six genes, only four to six genes, each with multiple um, variations, control the amount and type of melanin produced. Because of this, a wide variety of skin shades exist. In fact, it is quite easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shades in just one generation. Okay? Geneticists have found that if we were to take any two people from anywhere in the world, the basic genetic differences between these two people would typically be around 0.2%. Okay? Uh, even if, number one, even if they came from the same people group. Number two, racial, so-called racial characteristics account for only about 6% of this 0.2% variation. That means that so-called racial genetic variation between human beings of different so-called race is a mere 0.012%. Some people are nodding their heads. Some people are like, sounds very smart and clever. I believe it, yeah, <laughs> sounds cool, okay. The American ABC News Science page stated this. More and more scientists find that the differences that set us apart are cultural, not racial. Some even say that the word race should be abandoned because it's meaningless. We accept the idea of race because it's a convenient way of putting people into broad categories frequently to suppress them. Amen? The most hideous example is provided by Hitler's Germany. What the facts show is that there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. You know that even if you look at the DNA that influences your eye shape, and people will think like, oh, Chinese people, that's so, so, so different. Do you know that that's just because there's an extra layer of adipose, adipose tissue that's on their eyes. Everyone has it to varying degrees. They just have an extra layer. That's what makes their eyes look more almond-shaped and slanted. Does that make sense? Okay? As opposed to people think this is a different species of people because they look so different. And then there are those long haired people over there with like very blonde hair and they're completely. No! It's just to do with pigment and varying degrees of pigment. So, what does the Bible say about all of this? Number one, we must renew our minds. Because, guys, we've been programmed incorrectly. We must renew our minds. I still remember in the 90s, there's a guy called Troy Johnson. He was from LA. You know those guys from LA? And he was a musician. And he came and he was telling us all sorts of interesting info. Like he was um, saying that, yeah, everyone thinks that Michael Jackson was the one who invented the moonwalk. But that was happening back in the day, like in the, you know, downtown LA, you know. And I still remember Troy Johnson. And he said, guys, I'm confused because in America, I'm called black. But when I come here, people are telling me I'm colored. It confuses people. 
because of how we've categorized people. We must renew our minds. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Number two, we must not show favoritism. We must show no favoritism. The Bible is very strong on this. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, he says, I charge you, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Hear this, South Africa, do nothing out of partiality or favoritism. This is very important. You see, often what we do is we justify our racism. So people will say, it's okay for me to not like white people, Paul, because of what they did to us. You hear that a lot, don't you? I've heard people say things like, no, stealing, Paul, stealing is wrong. Stealing is very, very bad. Unless you're stealing from a white person, it's okay. Because then you're just taking back what was rightfully yours. You also hear that, don't you? And that type of rhetoric is very dangerous because the heart of man is greedy. So the moment people announce things like, hey, guys, yeah, no, you'll get your land. Who will get their land? Who? Not everyone is going to get land. Who? What are the rules about getting land? In what order? Who was more oppressed than who? Because what we've seen up in Zimbabwe, a lot of the guys who already had quite a lot of money were the guys who are now getting multiple piece properties of pieces of land. So who do you trust enough to be able to redistribute it in a particular way? And we, that's why we're going to talk about the land issue, by the way. We're going to talk about it in one of the messages, right? How do you go about it if you go about it? What's the godly way to do it? Amen? Amen. The Bible says, do nothing with partiality. Show no favoritism. How do you apply that in the way we govern a nation? How do you apply that in the way we govern our organizations? How do you stop someone from saying, oh, okay, if my cousin brother is getting that piece of land, so can I, and I'll determine at what rate I get it, and how I get it, and when I get it. Oh, the guys are delaying, let me go and now get it. Number three, we must honor people who fear God than preferring people based on their color. So when you're promoting someone, when you're raising up someone, when you're discipling people, when you're mentoring people, you're not doing it based on the color of their skin. You are raising up people based on their fear of the Lord. In Acts chapter 10, verse 28, and then verse 34 to 35, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Remember, this was Peter when he was dealing with Cornelius, right? He's saying it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. What laws do you have in your culture, in your nation, with regards to who you can associate with? Because the Jewish people had it. But it was racist, wasn't it? He says, you are well aware that it's against our law. They even had laws, just like in this country, for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God... Say to the person next to you, but God. You see, God's law is higher than the laws of man. There were laws here that would keep people apart, but God. And it's not the first time in history this happened. But God has shown me. What has God shown you? The things God has shown me. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So their religious system was now labeling certain people, not because of their sin, was labeling certain people as impure and unclean. Remember, when someone is unclean, what, were they, what do they do to them? They say, keep away from us. Go and stay by yourself. There were laws in this nation. You guys stay there, you guys stay there. Don't mix. And some of you still have that in your head because there's certain people you don't invite to your home. 
Although I was impressed with a lot of you the other day when I asked you, and you didn't seem to have prejudice in that arena. It goes on to say, verse 34 and verse 35, then Peter began to speak. I now realize, so he didn't always. So in other words, someone can start off racist and God can change them. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. There's no one group of people where he says, these are my people. Those people, they're cursed. And it actually becomes a problem because then there's so, there's so much mixture anyway. So if God had that mindset, then there'll be a bit of confusion because there's so much mixture anyway across those groups. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That's what God is looking for. Do you fear me? Are you doing what is right? So can you say the same thing that Peter said that I now realize? How many of you thought a certain way about race? But you can be honest with me and say, Paul, I now realize. At a certain point in your life, you had that realization that we all came from one person. In Romans chapter 10, verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. So calling on God is the great equalizer. Have you disqualified yourself based on the color of your skin? Have you disqualified others based on the color of their skin? Because the Bible says God blesses all who call on him. Have you justified your own prejudice? You know that sometimes hatred is perpetuated because we don't want to forgive. So we will justify our own hatred for certain people. I still remember at junior school, and don't ask me why we had these conversations at junior school, but we used to have them. And I remember I was only about maybe 10 or 11 at the time. And you know the history in Zimbabwe with the war that was there and so on. And at the school I was at, there were actually pictures of, of people who had died during the war. And they were there in the chapel. And one of those pictures was one of the parents, one of the dads of a friend of mine. And I remember this particular friend of mine, he said to me, his name was Adrian, he said to me, um, surely it's okay, but for me, I can be racist, racist, can't I, Paul? There's a white Zimbabwean. I can be racist, can't I, because my dad was killed in the war. So it's okay for me, isn't it? Are you hearing me? So from many different angles, many different nations, people justify their racism. Number four, prejudice is sin. In James 2, verse 4 and verse 9, it says, Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Judges with evil thoughts. In verse 9, it goes on to say, But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. If you show favoritism, you are sinning. Guys, let me be honest with you. We do it in this nation over and over again. Where there's someone, you won't laugh at their joke because of who it's, where it's coming from. But if it was someone else, you will laugh. But because this person wears a particular earth suit that you don't like, you're like, mm. There's a demonically inspired law of the land, but then there's also God's law. And here it says you've broken the law and you're lawbreakers when you show favoritism. Number five, prejudice is a sign of blindness. If you have racial prejudice in you, it means there's a blindness that is in you. In 1 John 2 verse 11 it says, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. And many people who thought this way, they'll tell you, Paul, I was blind. I couldn't see. Number six, we must look at the heart and not at the externals. We must train ourselves and renew our minds that when we look at someone, we're looking at their heart 
and not the externals. Amen? And I love it because if you, if you look in scripture, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it says, for we were all baptized by one spirit. There's no different Holy Spirit for different groups of people. Amen? So as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. That's the great equalizer. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, Samuel is about to pick the next king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider what? Do not consider his appearance. South Africa, I have news for you. When it comes to promotions in the workplace, do not consider his appearance or her appearance. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. If we want to change things in this nation, let me just go on a little rabbit trail a bit. If we want to change this thing, this, things in this nation, one of the biggest impacts of the apartheid system was education, where you had people who were just as clever as other people, but they didn't have opportunity. One of the key ways of, cha of rectifying that is giving people opportunity. We should be having some of the top private schools situated in townships. Are you hearing me? I think teachers should be paid way, way more than they're being paid right now. I think we should be like the Chinese who think in centuries and say, if we want to change a nation, what do we need to do? Oh, okay, we need to start this type of academy and we need artisans who do A, B, C, D and we need to make this kind of profession attractive. One of the professions that needs to be made more attractive is teaching. How many teachers do we have here? <laughs> Kudzi, is it just you? Okay, right? We need to... We, we, Teachers need to be paid way more. It needs to be made an attractive um, uh, profession, right? There are a lot of brilliant teachers where the main reason they aren't going into teaching is because of the money. We know that because we're seeing them today in all sorts of professions, but on the side, what are they doing? They're tutoring people in townships. One guy I was speaking to is doing great work in the Eastern Cape where he comes from and he was telling me he works for one of these organizations, Concord, Murray and Roberts, and he's doing amazing work in the Eastern Cape where they literally have, have tag teamed with universities, right? And they've got people tutoring in the high schools, pro bono. And he says to me, Paul, the thing I love, I just love teaching. I think he studied engineering as an engineer for Marion Roberts, but his passion is teaching. Imagine we got all those people into the teaching profession and we had some of the best schools in the marginalized areas today. And then what would happen is we would say, okay, guys, it's fair game. We, in terms of our biology, our IQ is not different. Now let's all apply. We've all got the same level of education and so on. Let's all apply fair game for that university over there. One of the worst things that BEE has actually done is where you have very competent black people being patronized because it's like there's an assumption that the only reason you're doing this is because you're black. I sometimes feel that way when I'm consulting because there are times where I will do a particular thing and then uh, someone will come to me and they'll say, yeah, no, it's really great because we also wanted, you know, like just more color diversity in this environment. So it's nice seeing a black person who's also clued up and so on. I'm like, you're also clued up. You know, it's like when someone comes to you and says like, you speak very well. And I want to say, well, so do you. <laughs> no, seriously. Because every child has to learn a language. So if you're saying I speak very well, are you saying that there's something in my biology that would stop me from speaking well and that you're surprised that I'm speaking well? You, you understand what I'm saying? There's a guy, um, uh, an oriental gentleman who's grown up in the States. He's American. And when people go up to him and say, you speak very well, he feels a bit insulted. He feels like, am I going to be treated as a migrant in the U.S. all my life? I also grew up in the United States. I live here. I'm also American. Can you see that some compliments become patronizing? Okay.
I told you about my cousin who's a doctor. I told you about it last week, didn't I? Where the one lady thought she was adopted. Okay, because she speaks well and she's clever. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. God is just amazing, isn't he? Do you know that a lot of people, you know, you know there's been studies done when it comes to voting for who's going to be the next American president and how come consistently we found that the taller guy is the one who gets voted for. Isn't it, is, what's, what's the relationship between height and leading a country? But that's our mindset. And I wish I could read to the Americans um, this, this scripture. Do not consider his appearance. Doesn't matter whether it's black or white, blue eyes, green eyes, or his height. There are a lot of very good short leaders. Some of them became dictators, unfortunately, like Mussolini. <laughs> okay. But you can actually do studies on that, hey? short leaders. And some of them would overcompensate because they were short and they were trying to prove a point. But it was interesting. Anyway, for, and, and this is what God says. He says, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. I don't know about you, but I want to be looking at the things God looks at. Not what people look at. And I'm saying, South Africa, stop it. Stop doing it. Renew, let's renew our minds. Let's look at what God looks at. He says, people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And then finally, number seven, and I like this one, and I know you might think I'm biased, but the Bible instructs us we must treat foreigners well. Raise your hand up if you're a South African. You're a South African citizen. Raise your hand up in this place. I love you guys. I love you. <laughs> No, seriously, we've adopted, this is our nation, our kids, all three of them were born here. We love South Africa. And you know what? The Bible says we must treat foreigners well. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 21, it says, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. And there are ways in which foreigners are being oppressed in South Africa today that aren't necessarily physical violence. Yes, there's the looting that's happening. But a lot of it is structural and institutional. A lot of it is institutional xenophobia. Are you, you hearing me this morning? Okay. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Almost every South African citizen, if you go back in your ancestry, you didn't come from here. Right? Kenya. Yeah. You guys know the history of this, this nation, right? You had the Khoi Khoi here, and then you had the Bantu migration, right? The guys who were the farmers, who then says, hey guys, let's teach the Khoi San how to farm, and you guys can teach us how to be hunter-gatherers hunter and that kind of thing. And then they lived together in the environment. The Bible here is saying, remember that you were once foreigners yourselves. You see, we forget very easily. And it's important that we truly forgive. Yes, apartheid was wrong. But I'm telling you, the only way a nation can be healed is through forgiveness. And how far back do you want us to go? Because we can go back, eh? We can go back, really far back if you want. And you can then have the Dumis over here and the, the, the Zimbabwean Debeles who ended up up there because of the, you know, the Defekani, the Mfekani and so on. They can also come down here and start saying to the Zulu people, hey, you guys, Shaka Zulu and so on, you guys, you moved us up and we also left land. They can also do that. I know my mother's side of the family, they, they came also from here. And it's actually not that far, uh, that long ago. So where do we draw the line? Do we go back 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? How far back do we go? 
I want to encourage you, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you are foreigners in Egypt. God hates xenophobia. It does not bring blessing to a nation. If you look at the nations of the world today that are really blessed, just in terms of living conditions, in terms of unemployment rate, where it's only 1% unemployment, nations like Canada. Look at how Canada treats foreigners. If you look at the nations that have become places of mercy, one of the redemptive, one of the redemptive gifts of Canada is that they will welcome people. It's mercy. If you look at the nations that are merciful, God blesses them. There are nations that are prospering. There are nations where there's hardly any crime. There's nation, there are nations where there's a lot of peace. If you want to get a job, you just get a job. It's easy. Let's not be a nation that is not blessed, where our children will grow up in the nation but can't get jobs and can't do much, where we keep finding ourselves in famine, in drought, in starvation. There are things that we do in this nation that affect things in the spirit realm. We want to be a blessed nation. Amen. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 to 34, it says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land. How many of you are foreigners residing in South Africa? You're a foreigner, but you're residing in South Africa. Okay? So this is the instruction we're giving South Africans concerning us here, right? When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you, are you listening South Africa? The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Praise God, hallelujah. Must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. Don't treat them as makwere kwere. Oh. Love them as yourself. If you've got prejudice towards, an, or towards Nigerians, love them as yourself. Instead of saying, I all Nigerians, these drug dealers. If you look at someone like Paul over there, a man of integrity, Paul Barnabas, and I'm not favoring him just because he's got the same name as me. A man of integrity, a godly man. A man where there's order in his household. A man with a wonderful wife, Agnes. Are you hearing me? I feel for Paul because I'm thinking to myself, in the business he runs and so on, and when he has to deal with banks and so on, I'm sure often when he says, I'm Nigerian and so on, I'm sure he experiences a lot of prejudice. Nigerian? Yeah. What type of business is this? I want to encourage you, let's have empathy, hey? Let's have empathy where we get into other people's shoes and we actually say to ourselves, what does it feel like being in that person's shoes? Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Do you know that one of the blessings on a nation is when foreigners come to your nation to work. And it can be a great blessing because when you've already got ownership and title deed and you have foreigners coming and working for you, you can end up making a lot of passive income because of that. When you've got the brains of the foreigners coming. Do you know that a lot of nations today on the African continent have been starved intellectually because the best of the best from those countries has come to South Africa. That's a blessing. Embrace it as a blessing. Don't see it as a curse. Let's have an abundance mentality where we're not like, they've come, they're taking our jobs. They're coming, they take. No, it can be a blessing to you. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you today, ladies and gentlemen, let's uproot the spirit of racism in our nation and let's redefine how we see this thing they've called race. Let's not focus on externals, but let's focus on the heart and let's love all people. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.